Next in line is cranial nerve number 10, the vagus nerve. So it arises by a series of rootlets that come from the lateral aspect of the medulla, and they merge and then leave the cranium also through the jugular foramen, just like cranial nerve 9 beforehand and just like cranial nerve 11 will afterwards. In fact, most usually, the vagus nerve will actually leave positioned between cranial nerve 9 and 11. So what was formerly called the cranial root of the accessory nerve is now actually part of the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve also has a superior ganglion right there, which is obviously sitting in the jugular foramen, and mainly it's concerned with the sensory component of the nerve. See, we can look right through here, all the way through the jugular foramen. Below the foramen is the inferior ganglion. Let's see how far we can get there. Let's have a look from the outside. Here we go. So here below the foramen is the inferior ganglion. It's also called the nodose ganglion. And that's concerned with the visceral sensory components of this nerve. So in the region of the superior ganglion, there are also connections to cranial nerve number nine and the superior cervical ganglion. So to the glossopharyngeal nerve and the superior cervical ganglion, which is, act which is actually a sympathetic ganglion. This is not visible here, but it's good to know about. So if we look at the course, let's have a look at the course of the vagus nerve now. We can see that the vagus nerve will then continue inferiorly. It's actually the longest nerve in the body. It's also called the wanderer. And it's within the carotid sheath. Remember, there's three things in the carotid sheath. There's the vagus nerve, the carotid artery. So it depends on where you are. If it's a common carotid artery or later on the internal carotid artery uh, and the internal jugular vein. And so it continues all the way down to the root of the neck. And on its way, it's going to supply branches to the palate of the mouth, to the pharynx, and to the larynx, importantly. Moving further south or further inferiorly, it's important to realize that the course of the vagus nerve is going to differ depending on what side you look at. See, we have a part of the vagus nerve that wraps around on the left side around the arch of the aorta and then comes back up. So what goes around comes back around. That might sound familiar, right? And so here's the recurrent laryngeal nerve that wraps around the arch of the aorta on the left side. On the right side, however, I know it's not shown here, but on the right side it actually loops around the right subclavian artery. So it loops up or loops around much higher up than on the left side. The reason for this is embryology, of course, as in most cases when we have interesting anatomy. And then moving inferiorly, both vagi will join the esophageal plexus, which surrounds the esophagus. And that's a mixed nerve plexus, which contains fibers that are both parasympathetic from the vagus, but also fibers that are sympathetic from the sympathetic trunks. And this esophageal plexus is going to follow the vagus nerve all the way through the diaphragm into the abdomen. Why don't I go ahead and hide the heart? I'm going to go ahead and add in the rest of the nerves here that we can see both the right and left vagus nerves and then of course the resulting vagal trunks. Hold on. Now let's dive into the thoracic cavity a little bit further. And here we can now see that there is the left vagus nerve over here and the left vagus nerve becomes anterior because it's running on the esophagus. And the right vagus nerve actually ends up becoming posterior to the esophagus. Here's the right vagus nerve. So you can see what happens is that the right vagus nerve dives behind the esophagus and the left one comes anteriorly. So I always use the mnemonic LARP, L-A-R-P, left anterior, right posterior vagal trunks that will then pierce the diaphragm together with the esophagus. You might also have a mnemonic for what position or what level the esophagus pierces the diaphragm. The mnemonic I use is I ate 10 eggs at 12. So the inferior vena cava passes through the diaphragm at T8. 10 eggs, so at T10, the E esophagus, and at 12 means the aortic hiatus is at T12. Either way, if we then follow this further down, here are your vagal trunks, and you can see that 
Here they contribute to a rich plexus of nerves. As I said, it is a mixed plexus of nerves all around the stomach and intestines as far as the left colic flexure. The left colic flexure is the region where a transition occurs between the vagus nerve for the parasympathetic supply and then the pelvic splanchnic nerves that then take over down there. So what is the vagus nerve supply? Somatic motor or branchial motor. The pharyngeal muscles via the pharyngeal plexus with fibers of the glossopharyngeal nerve. Muscles of the soft palate. All muscles of the larynx. This is why injury to the recurrent laryngeal nerves on the right or left side, as can happen, for instance, with some kind of neck surgery, let's say, for instance, a thyroidectomy, well, that can lead to dysphonia or aphonia, so loss of voice or impairment of voice. We have the visceral parasympathetics, which are incredibly widely distributed because, well, the fibers from the posterior or, or dorsal nucleus of the vagus nerve, they will supply the thoracic and abdominal viscera all the way to the left colic flexure. Yeah, it's also called the splenic flexure. In addition to that, the vagus nerve is trying to trump all the others. It also has somatic sensory, so general sensory. A little bit of general sensory actually comes from the dura, from the posterior cranial fossa. A little bit is from skin behind the ear. And there are special sensory taste fibers, believe it or not, from the root of the tongue and taste buds on the epiglottis itself. Quite an impressive nerve.